Hi, my name is Katherine Van Kuvering, and my co-authors are Austin Benson and John Kleinberg. Today I'll be presenting our paper, Random Graphs with Prescribed K-Core Sequences, a new null model for network analysis. Let's start with a motivating example. Let's say you have a graph that looks something like the one on the right. The nodes are lawyers, and the edges are friendships. If two nodes are connected by an edge, that means the lawyers are friends. This would be a very small example of a social network. And we want to ask the question, is this graph typical? Does it have anything that is unusual or unexpected? And this is a hard question to answer. If you were doing something with a data set and you were calculating, say, a mean, you might compare it to some kind of null model, like, for instance, a normal distribution. And we could do something similar with graphs. But of course, a normal distribution doesn't mean much to a graph. We have to find some other way to make a graph null model. And that way we can compare statistics about this graph to this null graph and get some idea of how unusual this graph is. Things like, does this graph have a typical number of edges? Does it have a typical number of triangles? Does it have a typical number of other patterns? The most common way to compare a graph to a null model is to use something called the configuration model. The configuration model randomizes the edges around a graph such that the degree sequence is held steady, essentially allowing you to choose a graph uniformly at random with any given degree sequence. This is done using a Markov model based on a switch chain. A switch chain is a very simple move. You find four nodes, such that they have two edges like this, and you simply switch them. And if you do enough random switch moves, you're guaranteed to get a completely random graph with a given degree sequence. However, the configuration model does have its weaknesses, one of which is it has a tendency to destroy local structure when randomizing edges. So there are other ways to approach graph null models, and we do this using KCOR. And KCOR is actually a very good way to look at local structure in graphs. The definition of a KCOR is, given a graph G and a number K, the KCOR of G is the unique maximal subgraph of G in which every node has degree at least K, it can be found efficiently by iteratively deleting nodes a degree strictly less than k in g. This is a little complicated. So for this talk, let's just think about something a little bit more simple. On the right is a graph that has its k-core uh, calculated. The core value of every node is put on the screen. You notice that the nodes of core value 3 are all connected to at least three other nodes that also have core value 3. And the nodes of core value 2 are connected to at least two other nodes that also have core value at least two. This is a good way to think about core values uh, simply. In order for a node to have core value C, it must be connected to at least C other nodes that also have core value at least C. This is a good start. Of course, we're not the first people to look at graph null models, and we're certainly not the first people to look at k-cores. In fact, there's a plethora of work out there looking at a variety of graph null models, the configuration model in particular. There are also a number of papers on k-cores and how they behave in different circumstances. In particular, there are a few papers on approximate k-core sampling rather than the exact k-core sampling that we present. I'd highly encourage people to check these out if they're doing anything that might involve a graph null model or if they're interested in understanding local structure in a graph. Okay. So we've established that we're looking for a graph null model that might be a little bit better at things like, for instance, local structure. And we have this statistic, the k-core, that tells us a lot about local structure. So how do we combine the two? Um, in this paper, we're doing something very similar to the configuration model, but instead of holding the degree sequence steady, we're holding the core sequence steady. We're going to show how to uniformly sample from graphs that match any graph G in its k-core properties. We're going to do this in a very similar way to how the configuration model was done. There are three steps to this. First, we have to have a realizability proof to show what core sequences are even possible. Just like not every degree sequence is possible, not every core sequence is possible. Next, we need to define a move set to create our Markov chain. The configuration model has the switch. Ours is a little bit more complicated. And finally, 
we need to prove that the state space of graphs with the core sequence is connected by our move set. This is very similar to proof to how this is done in the configuration model. As we said, the first step of this is a realizability proof to understand what core sequences are possible. And it turns out there's only one rule. If k is the largest core value in a core value sequence, then there must be at least k plus 1 instances of k in the sequence for the sequence to be realizable. And that's the only rule. We won't get into the proof here, but one way to understand this is, of course, we need at least k plus 1 nodes in the k core so that every node in the k core can have at least k neighbors in that core. So it seems pretty clear that there must be at least k plus 1 instances of k. And then the rest of the nodes can be linked to as many of the k plus 1 nodes of the k core as necessary. For instance, let's pretend k is 5. And if we have a node with core value 2, we just link it to two nodes in the 5 core. The next step is that we need to define our move set. The configuration model only had one move, which was a switch. We have three different kinds of moves, but they are very similar in style. We'll be showing them here by going from a purple edge to an orange edge or orange edge to a purple edge. Every move is reversible. The first one is move endpoint. And the way this works is you need three nodes, H, I, and J. J must be of a lower core value than H and I. And there must be an edge either between HJ or IJ, but not both. And in this case, we simply take the, move, the edge between HJ and turn it into IJ, or the edge between IJ and turn it into HJ. This will not affect the core value of any node in this graph. The next move may seem deceptively simple. In short, we can add or delete any edge in the graph, provided that adding or deleting that edge does not affect the core values of any nodes in the graph. For instance, here, we add the edge between i and j. This, in fact, will not affect the core value of any node in the graph. They were all core value 2 to start with, and they're all core value 2 afterwards. Similarly, we could then delete ij, and it wouldn't affect anything either. However, if we added ij and then also added the edge at the bottom, that would affect the core values of every node in the graph. At the end of adding both those edges, every node would have core value 3. It's not always easy to tell whether or not adding an edge is going to cause a problem. And in fact, this is probably what slows down our algorithm the most. Every time you want to add an edge, you have to check and see, is this going to be an issue? And the only way to check is to add it and then recalculate the core values. This is very slow. However, deleting an edge is usually immediately obvious whether or not it's going to cause a problem. For instance, if both of these edges were in place and then we deleted one, the core values of the nodes adjacent to that edge would immediately change. And that would tell us we have an issue. This is not true for adding an edge. Our final set of moves is probably the most complicated. We call these collapsing and expanding. On the left, you'll see what we do is we delete an edge between ij and we add two edges ih and hj. And what this is is if you can find two nodes with some lower core value c and there's an edge between them, you can delete that edge and instead add two edges to a node of higher core value. Similarly, you can delete two edges to, that are connected to a higher core and move them down into one edge between two nodes of the same lower core. On the right hand side, we have a similar thing, which is a half expand, half collapse. Put simply, you don't add one of these orange edges. And this usually comes into play when J, for instance, is already connected to enough nodes of a higher core that adding another connection would actually affect the core value of J. Just like with add and delete, you can only do this if it won't affect the core value of any node in the graph. Now that we've established what our move set is, we need to prove that this move set connects the state space of all possible graphs with any given k-core sequence. While I won't go into the full proof here, I can give you the four steps that we get reused to establish this proof. And I encourage you to all look at the proof in the actual paper if you have time. The four steps are first, we link all nodes of lower core value to the top core. And we do this using expand and move endpoint. Next, we convert our top core to a k-uniform graph. A k-uniform graph is something we've defined, and it's very similar to a k-regular graph, except there might be one node of degree k plus 1. 
We do this using add delete. Next, we transform between k uniform graphs. Because a k uniform graph is just a degree sequence, we can transform from one to another using a switch chain. And finally, we concatenate the subpaths. Because we've defined this canonical graph and we've proven we can get to it from any other graph in the state space, we simply reverse the moves and we can get to any other graph in the state space from this canonical graph. This is extremely similar to how this is proven for the configuration model. So we have established that it is possible to sample uniformly at random from the collection of all graphs with a given core sequence. But the question is, is this useful? We already have the configuration model as a very easy to use and handy null model for graphs. Why do we also need the k-core model? Well, the answer is they can give you very different results. This is a striking example. We do a very similar analysis here to something done on the configuration model in the Milo et al. paper from 2004. These graphs uh, look at how common different subgraphs are in the canonical data set versus the null models. The subgraphs are labeled at the bottom, but essentially the configuration model is in green and the k-core model is in orange. And if they are above the black line, that means that the subgraph appears more often in the null model than in the real data. If it's below the black line, it means the subgraph appears more frequently in the real data than in the model. What's important here is that the configuration model and the k-core model are quite different in almost every single respect, only a few places where they're even close. That means that if you were using the configuration model to make some decision about how common or uncommon these subgraphs were as compared to a random graph, you'd come to a different conclusion with the configuration model than with the k-core model. Another striking example is using attribute-based assortativity. This looks at how frequently edges appear between nodes that have similar or different levels of various attributes. In this case, we again look at the lawyer's friendship data. We look at attributes such as gender, office location, law school, etc. And this can maybe tell you something about bias and how the graph was formed or the data around the graph. This is then compared to some null model or random graph to see whether or not this bias is significant. What's interesting here is yet again, there's a difference. At least in the case of gender, if you look at the configuration model versus the k-core model, it would be significantly more biased than one would expect in the configuration model, but it would not be significant if you compared it to a k-core model. And while you can see that the z-score changes for almost every single one of these attributes, this is perhaps the most significant. Again, you would come to a different conclusion using a different model. We did several other experiments and I'll only go through a couple here. One of the uh, what things we did is look at edge counts. Of course, in the configuration model, the edge count is held steady, whereas in the k-core model, the edge count fluctuates. While we have a proof in the paper for how big or small the edge count can possibly be, what you'll see from here is that at least in these different graphs, the edge count for the k-core model tends to be slightly higher than you'd see in the real data, but also with a very narrow standard deviation. You can also look at degree sequence. Again, degree sequence is held steady in the configuration model, but will change looking at the k-core model. What we can see here really isn't very different. While the degree sequence does fluctuate, it stays remarkably close to the real data set. However, in the case of triangle degrees, we see something different. The triangle degree asks how many triangles any particular node is part of. What we can see here is that in the case of these graphs, the k-core model actually sticks closer to the real data in terms of triangle degree than the configuration model does. Triangle degree is another way of looking at local structure, so it perhaps makes sense that the k-core model is very close to the real data in this case. Of course, there's a lot more work to be done. We see this paper as merely an entry point for the k-core null model into the network science lexicon. One thing in particular that we have not proved in this paper is mixing time. How long do you have to run this model before you get a reasonably random sample? This is a very difficult thing to prove, even in terms of configuration model, and we don't address this in the paper. There are also lots of other models out there that it could be useful to compare the k-core null model with, things such as the DK series, onion decomposition, or triangle counts. If you'd like to try it yourself, code could be found uh, to do this model with any graph that you have at hand at the website below. Thank you so much for your time.